If we are to believe the newspapers, the media generally, stress management uh, industry, the pharmaceutical industry, organizational and occupational psychologists, if we believe them, we are living in a stressful world. We are living in an age of stress. Our babies are stressed before they're born, supposedly. Our children are stressed by endemic bullying, by the pressure of routine exams, by the breakup of homes and families and marriages. We are stressed trying to cope with young children, with jobs, with economic insecurities. The world is supposedly under stress as well. We talk about the world economy under stress, according to James Lovelock uh, and his Gaia hypothesis. The cosmos is under stress, struggling to maintain some, uh, some kind of functional stability, some homeostasis in the face, for example, of extreme climate change. Animals suffer from stress, which apparently changes the way they taste after they've been slaughtered because the release of hormones that change the meat. One of the interesting things, though, about the ways in which we talk about stress is that although we all know when we're stressed, we all can recognize the signs, the symptoms of stress. My children say, I shout, I'm irritable when I'm stressed, which is absolutely accurate. Although we know that, there is no clear definition of stress. We don't have a clear understanding of the mechanisms by which environmental pressures make us ill, physically or psychologically. And perhaps more importantly for me, we don't have a historical sense of where stress came from, either as a term, a concept, or a set of experiences. There have been some studies, uh, historical studies of stress, and they have generally made two claims, closely related claims. The first is that the language of stress only fully emerged in the 1950s, in the decades after the Second World War. So from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, stress was introduced as a concept within medicine in particular, and then became one of the dominant ways of talking about health and disease. The second claim they make is that from that time, from the 50s, stress has emerged as one of the signature conditions of the age. Most people are stressed. The rates of stress-related diseases have increased. And they explain that pattern generally in terms of the breakdown of modern society. This is a, a postmodern sickness, if you like. A sickness that is the result of the fragmentation of families, societies, and communities. So it's very much a condition of the late 20th century. Those claims are what I want to address today, to think about today, and hopefully to challenge in some kind of way what has been written about by historians. And there are three general areas that I'm going to talk about. At the start, I'm going to give you some sense of how people through the 70s, 80s, and 90s recognized the manifestations of stress in uh, recent populations. Then I'm going to explore some of the models, physiological and psychological particularly, that were formulated to try and explain the impact of stress uh, in recent decades. And then in the last uh, third or half, I'm going to challenge the ways in which historians have analysed the modern history of stress and suggest that there's a longer history, a different history that has to be told. According to Toffler then, writing in the early 70s, Recent populations, populations during the 70s and 80s, were, were subject to what he called future shock. And he explained this in terms of the, the severe, extreme cultural changes that people were having to adapt to. So the disease of change, he called it. And he suggested that particularly in Western countries, it was the unwanted tempo of life that was making people learn in lots of ways, both organically, psychologically, in terms of their behavior as well. And the kinds of changes that Toffler indicted for the emergence of stress and shock uh, in populations in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was this, the transience of things, places, and people. He called it the death of permanence. Rapid technological and social innovation, cultural change as well, and a surfeit of choice in consumables, <coughs> education, the media. These were the, the manifestations of a rapidly changing society that he argued were making people ill. And the manifestations of that process of having to adapt to rapid social and technological change could be seen at a number of levels. In the first instance, many people, Toffler included, suggested that this pressure to adapt to rapid social change was causing a rise in chronic organic diseases, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, 
but also psychological disorders, depression, uh, anxiety, uh, and suicide. And you can see Claudia Wallace was a journalist writing in Time magazine, the front cover of Time this year. This is almost the year when stress appears to hit the media big time. Front cover uh, image uh, of stress and anxiety, and then a long feature article suggesting that stress was known by this stage to be a major contributor to many chronic diseases uh, that were major causes of death uh, in the US in particular. So the first set of manifestations of stress, according to Toffler uh, and his peers, was the rise in both organic uh, and psychological disorders. But there were other manifestations for Toffler uh, and, and other commentators in this period. Increased aggression, violence and crime was supposedly related to the challenge of adaptation, rapidly changing society, the demise of sexual standards, the instability of international power relations, and particularly in many of these debates, increased sickness absence. Debates about the relationship between environmental pressures and sickness absence had started soon, and they were there certainly in the interwar years in the work of James Halliday and others that I'll come on to later. But in the 1960s, they became more pertinent in debates about the efficiency of the civil service, particularly under Harold Wilson. There were a number of surveys set up to try and evaluate the impact of working conditions uh, on sickness absence. And stress emerged as one of the ways of explaining the economic <coughs> burden and the personal burden uh, of stress at work, of, of explaining sickness absence. So here are the manifestations of stress in the 1970s. This idea that we were struggling to adapt, struggling to cope with changing circumstances, and those struggles were manifest in a variety of ways, psychological, physical, uh, and social and behavioral. How did people explain the relationship between stress and disease, stress and psychological disease, stress and behavior? There were two main models and one subsidiary model. The two main models were a physiological account of stress that I'll say something about, psychological studies of stress in this period, and the occasional attempt to merge those into a biopsychosocial model of stress and disease. And I'll say something about all three of those. Physiological studies of stress are often traced to this man. He is one of the pivotal figures in the emergence, the creation of a physiological model of how environmental stress and pressure makes us ill. Celia, he was, he was at the heart of the way I conceived the book in many ways. When I first started doing the research, I was going to write a biography of Celia. It became apparent fairly rapidly that that was not going to be particularly satisfying, and there was a much bigger story to be told. But Celia is still very much at the heart of the book. He was born uh, in a small town, Comoron, on the border between Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Um, studied medicine uh, at the German University of Prague, and then did a PhD in chemistry, before emigrating first to Johns Hopkins, where he spent a year or two. Uh, and then went to Montreal, where he worked first at McGill between 33 and 45, and then moved to the University of Montreal, where he set up his own Institute of Experimental Medicine and Surgery. When he was at McGill, he was working with James Bertram Collick, who was one of the team who had isolated and identified the mechanism of insulin uh, in relation to diabetes. Uh, Collick was a biochemist at McGill, and Hans Selye was first appointed to a lectureship in biochemistry. His first use of the term stress, in fact, was in a paper published in 1935 with Thomas McEwen, who was his PhD student, who later came to Birmingham to become a professor of social medicine. But the start of the stress story for many historians is 1936, when Celia published uh, a very short paper in Nature, setting out what he called the general adaptation syndrome. This is the, the physiological process that animals go through in trying to adapt to environmental pressures. And the, uh, the syndrome occurred in three phases, and it was reproducible. This was a non-specific response. The first phase was the alarm phase. So if you stress an animal, it will go into some kind of shock, very much like Walter Cannon's fight-or-flight response, adrenaline uh, generating certain types of physiological responses. If that shock, that challenge persisted, then the animal would start to compensate and go through a stage of resistance or adaptation when on the surface it appeared to be maintaining functional stability, but underneath the mechanisms, the physiological mechanisms, were working overtime to maintain uh, function. And the final stage, if that mechanism of adaptation failed, according to Celia, or if the stimulation went on too long, if the demand to adapt went on too long, then the animal went into a phase of exhaustion and death. And that became, in the 30s and 40s, one of the earliest, the clearest laboratory models of what became stress uh, in many physiological debates. Most of Celia's life was spent, his, his 
his research life was spent trying to elucidate the mechanisms of the general adaptation syndrome. If you take an animal and stress it, what are the pathways to disease? What are the physiological and pathological processes that make that animal ill? Most of his experiments were incredibly crude. Most of them done on rats. They were subjected to stresses like starvation, extreme hot, extreme, uh, extreme heat, extreme cold, um, prolonged and extreme exercise quite often. He would then sacrifice the rats and examine the various organs and the tissues. And as a result of that, he began to suggest that the mechanism by which uh, animals adapt to prolonged stress was not the adrenal medulla, the secretion of adrenaline, but the adrenal cortex uh, through the steroid hormones that were produced from the cortex. And he began then to explore the, the physiological pathways, suggesting that the pituitary is crucial because it controls the adrenal cortex. So he began to talk about the adrenal pituitary axis, uh, axis. And then to suggest that it was corticosteroids rather than adrenaline that were mediating reactions to the environment. And he began probably from, from the 1950s. He, he talked about adrenal adaptation syndrome until about 1950. And he gave uh, uh, the Heberden oration, in fact, here in, uh, not here, be careful what I say, in London. Um, and that's for Gail, that one. Um, in London in 1950, when he suggested what, what came out of that lecture was it, was, it was entitled The General Adaptation Syndrome, but he began to suggest that he was going to use the term stress or stress syndrome to replace General Adaptation Syndrome, partly, partly because General Adaptation Syndrome was, was, was cumbersome um, and he, it had come under some criticism. So he began to shift his terminology and his formulation, started talking about the stress syndrome. When he was feeling really megalomaniacal, he would talk about cellular syndrome, um, but increasingly talking about stress. The general adaptation syndrome was the mechanism by which stress made animals ill under certain conditions. What cellular was particularly interested in was the pathways, the mechanisms by which those kinds of environmental pressures, those extreme stresses, made animals ill. And it, this, this um, illustration on the right is, is a pretty characteristic one from Celia. There's a non-specific damage at the top, which we'll talk about. The first mediator of stress reactions, Celia never identified. And it, it partly frustrated him. When he was asked about it, he just said, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the pathways. I want to understand what the mechanisms are through the hypothesis, the pituitary, uh, through the adrenal cortex, the release of hormones, creating certain end organ effects under prolonged stimulation. The hypothalamus was, was inserted into that picture as well, into that pathway above the pituitary, so people began to talk about the hypothalamus as the coordinator, the orchestrator, then through the uh, release of hormones from the pituitary, ACTH and others, and then the release of hormones from the cortex. And you can see the variety of diseases that Celia claimed he had induced in animals as a result of prolonged exposing them to prolonged stress, so high, high, high blood pressure, cardiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, renal disease, peptic ulcers, and so forth. A set of diseases that were also interesting um, physicians interested in psychosomatic medicine, or holistic constitutional medicine in this kind of period, a very similar set of chronic conditions, the etiology of which at this stage was almost entirely unknown. And Celia picked on those diseases, tried to demonstrate the ways in which environmental pressure created those diseases, and developed a formula, a model for the physiology of stress that explained that, that relationship between the environment, uh, the animal, uh, and disease. There were many objections to Celia's formulation. He was incredibly influential in many, many ways. He became a leading expert on endocrinology, for example, the biochemistry of steroid hormones. And he was nominated for the Nobel Prize 17 times in the space of four years in the 1940s, 1950s. Um, and I think it was much to his disappointment that he was never awarded it, um, in spite of his best efforts quite often, I think. Um, but the objections to his work were numerous. One is that he experimented only on animals, that this was not necessarily relevant in the study of human disease. The second is that he subjected his animals to extreme forms of physical stress. And one of the things that the psychosomatic medics were saying is that, in fact, most human stress is psychological, chronic, low grade, that this does not equate the kind of stresses that, 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 that Celia was putting on his animals doesn't equate to the kind of stresses that make people ill. His, his 
Physiological histological work was also criticised for being fairly crude. It was a descriptive histology, a descriptive physiology, in which he subjected animals to stress, killed them, cut them up, weighed the adrenal gland, weighed various other organs, and then used those crude measurements as evidence of adrenal involution, for example, or thymic involution, or lymphatic changes. And in debates with Walter Cannon, uh, during the 20s and 30s, in fact, one of Cannon's concerns was the kind of crude histology, anatomy, physiology that Selly was engaging with here. So there are a number of, of technical concerns amongst laboratory physiologists, particularly about the way that Selly did his work, which led to some of it being dismissed. He was also, I think, an incredibly irritating man in lots of ways. And when you go to, I went to Montreal and interviewed a lot of people who had known him, and there's a real split. Some people were complete disciples, um, massively convinced that what he had was both tremendous charisma and intellectual capacity to understand chronic disease. The other half of the population who knew him in Montreal hated him. Um, he was megalomaniacal, uh, egotistical, um, completely arrogant on many, many levels. Also a, a serial philanderer, uh, philanderer. He went through several wives, upset most of his children, his wider family, his colleagues, almost everybody. Sort of, uh, you know, a major split. And he, he, he irritated a lot of people worldwide as well, which is maybe one of the reasons why he never got the Nobel Prize. Not necessarily because of the drawbacks in some of his work, because I think some of his contributions to serial chemistry were stunning. His understanding of the endocrine system, I think some of those contributions are fantastic. But I think there was a tremendous sense of hostility. Um, and it wasn't until 20 years, 24 years after his death, that he was inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame once everybody who hated him had died, essentially. <laughs> right. Now, I, I think this is what people admit in Montreal, that, that, that memory had eventually erased his bad side, and they suddenly realized, actually, he'd done some reasonable things. So, this is the kind of model, the physiological model of stress and disease that Celia tried to um, build, the gospel of stress, as some people call it, uh, in the Lancet and the BMJ in this country, uh, in response to his heaven oration in uh, 1950. Gradually, because of those flaws in the theory, people began to turn away from these rather crude physiological studies. They didn't disappear completely, and Celia's influence didn't disappear. It's still fine. My daughter is doing um, dentistry at Bristol University, and she texted me, as students do in the middle of a lecture, um, a couple of weeks ago, saying, I've got this guy, lecturer, talking about Celia and stress. As using Celia's model to explain the neuroendocrinology of stress reactions to dental students. His model still retains a pivotal place in some studies of the physiology of stress and adaptation, even though most physiologists during the 60s, 70s, and 80s began to dismiss it for these reasons. One of the major aspects, one of the major flaws, perhaps, is Celia's incapacity to identify the first mediator, a non-specific damage. What is it? that triggers the stress response. And one of the responses to that problem was to encourage people to begin to look at the psychology of stress. People began to suggest in that period that what mattered in terms of stress reactions was not necessarily that non-specific chain of events that Sully was describing, but the perception of a stressful environment, the way you responded and reacted, perceived, responded and reacted to an environment. And there were a number of studies in this period um, in which, and partly this was triggered, as were some of the physiological studies by experiences during the Second World War, by studies of, of pilots under stress, for example, during the 40s and 50s, or civilian populations under the stress of bombing as well. A number of studies trying to increase military efficiency, trying to understand stress uh, uh, in operational terms uh, amongst the armed forces, beginning to look both at the, at the psychology as well as the physiology, and in some cases trying to merge them. There are two or three key models, I think, in this period uh, that were put forward to understand the kind of stresses and the adaptational pressures that Toffler began to talk about in the 70s. The first is the work of Thomas Holmes and Richard Ray, who, building on the work of constitutional doctors, people like George Draper and perhaps Adolf Meyer's notion of a life chart, as his early 20th century um, psychoanalysts and, and psychosomatic physicians who were trying to trace the relationship between environmental pressure, the stress of certain aspects of your life, and the appearance of illness. And some of the first observations from, from, from George Draper and others, and in fact from Holmes and Ray as well, is what they noticed is that the, emerge, the onset of illness 
often happened about a year or two, within a year or two, after a major life stress, bereavement, uh, losing a job, uh, financial insecurity, whatever it might be, that often that preceded those kind of life events, those recent experiences, the schedule of recent experiences, what they tried to develop, precede the onset of uh, certain uh, physical and psychological uh, diseases. And they developed this in, uh, the classic paper is in 1967, when they introduced the social readjustment rating scale. And what they did here was they identified a series of life events, uh, ranked 42 life events there are in the full scale, and they gave them to people and said, rate these according to the perception you have of their damage in your life. How are these rated in terms of the, uh, of the effects they have? And they ended up with a standardized scale. Uh, and you can see it going there, death of a spouse, divorce, marital separation, and so forth. A variety of life stresses that they suggested both explained why people became ill at certain moments in time and also could be used as a predictor of illness. So when you have a patient who comes in and uh, somebody has died in the family or they've gone through a separation, they've lost their job, whatever it might be, that might be a signal for the clinician to take a closer look at that patient and, and consider whether that might be the trigger for certain types of diseases. These, well, one of the interesting things about this uh, social readjustment rating scale, it still persists in some forms uh, in many countries. The cultural specificity of it is quite interesting. There's the argument that um, uh, Holmes and Ray are in fact uh, split and started doing different things eventually. Holmes carried on with the social, working on the social readjustment rating scale. Um, and one of the things he suggested is that although there are cultural differences, they, they did some studies between uh, Japan and the USA, for example, and Afro-Cambrian populations and white populations and so forth, trying to get a sense of the cultural specificity. The general pattern, the general trend in terms of measuring them was identical. There were odd differences in Japan. It, was a, it, was a, it is a cause of tremendous dishonor to go into prison, and that was rated higher up on that list to get into trouble uh, with the authorities, much higher on that list uh, than in Western countries. But generally, it was felt, Holmes and Ray suggested, that this was non, relatively non-specific culture. It was shared by many cultures, this. And this was used, as I said, as a measure of... Of it, uh, as a way of explaining disease, but also a way of perhaps predicting disease. Rea went on to uh, develop life change, the notion of life change units, and what became the stress and coping inventory, which I'll say something more about in a moment, or at least in terms of coping. So, psychological studies of stress, driven partly by a concern about, about um, Air Force personnel in the Second World War in particular in that post-war period, and driven by a dissatisfaction with the physiological studies of stress and an awareness that people still had not understood what it was that triggered those physiological pathways. The other key figure um, was Richard Lazarus, um, who was um, very much a, a supporter of cellular In fact, it's interesting because he was interested in the psychology of stress, wrote a number of books in the 50s, 60s, 70s about the psychology of coping, the psychology of adaptation, about how individuals, families, communities, and societies adapt. But he was very keen to incorporate Celia's model of the physiology of stress into his own work, particularly in terms of the non-specific nature uh, of stress. His argument, though, was that what mattered, this goes back to the first mediator, identifying the first mediator, is not the non-specific trigger, but how you perceive it. How do you appraise that event, that situation, that environmental circumstance? And that is the key factor in whether you become ill or not. You, uh, the process of primary appraisal, he said, was how you identify the danger in a situation, which may be um, based not only on the situation, but also your own history, your own constitution, your own experiences will feed into and condition you in certain ways. And then the manifestations of stress will depend upon how you cope. Having appraised the situation, what coping mechanisms do you have? And it's the processes of appraisal and coping, Lazarus suggested, that determines whether those pathways, those hormonal pathways are triggered, how they're triggered and how long they remain triggered to produce disease. So the two main models in this period to explain the kind of manifestations that Toffler was exploring in the 1970s were the physiological and the psychological. There were, of course, uh, attempts to bring these together in biopsychosocial models, the work of George Engel, particularly uh, in the biopsychosocial uh, realm. But this is one that's perhaps more familiar, the idea of the type A personality, um, first put forward in 1959 by Friedman and Rosenman who did this study of, of uh, cardiologists, and they had a waiting room, 
uh, much like this. And what they noted is that when the patient sat the edge of the seat, rather than sitting like Steve here on the back of the seat, with the back of the seat being worn, what they noticed was that the front of the edge of the seat was worn, as if their patients were agitated, as you might be going to see a cardiologist, but agitated up and down all the time, wearing away the front of the seat. And what they thought was that patients with heart disease therefore were more agitated than the normal population. They had some drive, some activity within them that was driving them beyond normal. And they did this study, um, they performed a study where they divided people into, into groups, group A, group B, and then a, a group C. And, and the, the, the most important groups were group A and group B. The group A was the ones who had hurry sickness, incessant sense of urgency, meeting deadlines, driving competitive, forceful personalities. Um, all done on men this. The group B, type B, much more relaxed, much more chilled, much calmer. And they suggested that. In fact, the only, the only clear correlation in this early work was that if you were type A personality, you would have high cholesterol. And that was the link, they thought, between personality and heart disease. It was through its impact on cholesterol, through the association, at least, between personality and cholesterol levels. Now, do people still talk about type A? I guess we probably do, don't we? We still talk about type A and type B in some kind of ways. It, it, it fell into disrepute during the 1780s. But in the time that Toffler was writing, this was a major model for explaining the relationship to environment, pressure, uh, and disease. And you find most of the major professions, doctors, um, nurses, teachers, for example, in the professional journals of those professions, type A, type B personalities become absolutely important. How do we manage the type A personality nurse so that he or she doesn't get ill? How do we manage the type A personality teacher so that they don't develop uh, the symptoms of chronic disease. So it became, for a period, a really striking model that tried to bring together certain psychological and behavioral characteristics with the biology of cholesterol and heart disease. There were others, but this is perhaps the most famous. Now, so what I've tried to set out is, in the period when Toffler was writing, 1760s, 70s, 70s and 80s, there was a sense in which the population, Western populations in particular, were entering an age of stress. They were consumed by stress. They were, they were preoccupied by it, but also being made ill by it. There were a number of models, scientific, physiological, psychological, and biopsychosocial models for explaining that. The question I want to come back to now, uh, towards the end, towards the last uh, however many minutes I've got, is to what extent do we believe that this is an age of stress? To what extent do we believe this is a novel phenomenon in this period that all of these people claim? They're all saying we're getting stressed, we're suddenly getting stressed, this is the way we need to understand it. The historians are agreeing with that. Some historians, most historians talking on this will say that the 1950s is crucial. Some will go back to that 1936 paper of Hans Selye and say that's the start of stress research. What I want now to think about is whether that is sustainable as an argument. Can we explain stress only in terms of that post-Second World War period, only in terms of the fragmentation of modern society and the emergence of, a, uh, of a, an unstructured, unstable, postmodern world? What I want to do is entirely ahistorical in the sense that I want to run the clock backwards. This is the way it's going to go from here. If we take the story back to 1949, this is the first moment I want to consider. This is James Lorimer Halliday, um, trained in Scotland as a physician, became one of the public health officers, a regional medical officer for the Department of Health in Scotland, spending a lot of his time assessing claims for benefit, interested particularly in sickness absence, and also interested in psychosomatic medicine, the relationship between the mind and the body in determining conditions as you saw in Cellier's. In fact, Cellier and Halliday wrote and talked about each other and they corresponded through the journals on various issues. Halliday's concern, this is writing just after the Second World War, but his argument was that it was during the interwar years, during the recession during the interwar years, when society began to fragment, when there was a disequilibrium, a disintegration of the, of the old traditional social values that began to create disharmony in the world and to make people ill and to um, 
make it impossible for them to work. The sickness absence was where he started some of his work. And in fact, the ways in which Halliday formulated this in terms of disequilibrium, in terms of functional disorder, in terms of psychosomatic disease, is very, very similar to the kind of framework that Toffler was suggesting in 1972. Here's a deeper roots of that formulation that people were under pressure to adapt, to cope with a dramatically changing society. And uh, part of Halliday's argument was that, um, uh, and of course one might want to reframe this now, is that, is that the rising incidence of peptic ulcers was a mark of a major sign of socioeconomic disruption during the interwar years. This was one of his case studies, was that peptic ulceration was a product, the rise during the 40s and 50s was a product of interwar uh, social disturbances, social disintegration. He also talked about almost precisely the same range of social and behavioural problems that Toffler did. Um, changing fertility rates, rising levels of aggression and violence and so forth were key to Halliday's argument that we were living in a sick society struggling to adapt to those conditions. Let's go back a little bit further, only a, only a, a decade or so, and this is uh, Thomas Horder, Lord Horder, who was a leading physician uh, working at St. Bart's Hospital, but also a physician to the great and the good, to the monarchs and the prime ministers of the period, and arguing here that modern civilizations were under stress and strain, that they were struggling to adapt. If you think back, I mean, I'm not going to read it all, but there's the competition of living, international insecurity, the pace of life, the precariousness of life, the monotony and drabness of work, etc., etc., etc. And he ends up with this real rant about needless, stupid, provocative, ill-mannered, selfish noise, which sort of resonates nicely with the opening of that film from Toffler, with that horribly discordant music, if you can call it music, or noise, at the beginning of it. This is the modern world, he's saying. This is the world that we are having to cope with, and it's making us ill. This is the strain of modern civilization, formulated in Horder's words, in very much the same language and the same conception apparatus as Toffler 20 or 30 years later. If we go back a little further, this earlier that decade, Langdon Brown was one of the, again, a, a prominent position, one of the regarded as one of the um, leading lights in the early field of endocrinology, um, hormonology as people called it then. Um, suggesting again that one of the key challenges facing populations in the interwar years was this, this challenge to adapt, to cope to a world uh, with a world in which the old sense of security is gone and conditions that are changing so rapidly. And it was this that explained the emergence of chronic ill health uh, in Western populations in particular. Again, a very similar formulation of the way in which rapid social and economic change was making people ill through, environment, through the environmental pressure of having to respond to those changes. This is taking us, this is more familiar territory in some ways uh, in historical studies of mental illness in particular. William Sadler here was talking about um, the rise of heart disease, but he was talking about it largely in the context uh, as well of neurasthenia and what was called Americanitis, which is the name uh, William James used to describe his own neurasthenia to start with. And the argument was, and, and again one can see the familiar refrain here, the sort of forerunner, if you like, of type A personality, as well as the concern about technological change, that rising mortality from high blood pressure and heart disease, as well as the neurasthenia that Sadler was interested in, was the result of the tension, the incessant drive of American life, the excited strain uh, of the American temperament. And that, again, you can see it very clearly here. This is adaptation and natural selection not being able to cope with the stress of civilization. And again, this, this sense of the technological change that is impacting on people and making them ill. And again, you can go back to the, the Toffler image at the beginning of a harsh technological world, travel, communication, etc., etc., speeding up, putting people under pressure is evident in Sadler's formulation of Americanitis uh, here. The other thing, of course, uh, to mention about this is that in some ways, Americanitis is double-edged. It's a cause of heart disease, but it's also a source of tremendous honour and pride, like the type A personality, because it demonstrates your productivity, your capacity, your capability. It is only the Americans, the arguments say, that suffer from neurasthenia or Americanitis. This is born in America. This is made in America, this condition. And, and that is 
part of the glory of the American nation in this period as they suffer from these kinds of civilized nervous conditions because of the excited strain and the stress uh, of Western civilization. But again, the point I want to make here is that one can trace further back the language of stress, the relationship between civilization, technological change, social change, and the manifestation of precisely the kinds of conditions that Toffler and others are concerned about uh, in the late 20th century. Going back to the late 19th century now, we're going back a little bit further, 20th century, this is 70 or 80 years before Toffler is writing. Now, Clifford Albert is, is interesting, of course, Regis Professor of Physics at Medicine <laughs> at Cambridge, a leading figure in the field, a leading writer on neurasthenia and heart disease and various other conditions. He wrote this, um, edited this big volume, a system of, we call it the system of medicine, I can't remember what it's called, the Humphrey Wollaston, a big series of, of major textbooks on medicine in which he contributed um, chapters on neurasthenia and heart disease, heart strain, I think it was called his chapter in that. <laughs> now, this is an interesting quote in many ways. Here he is, here is all but saying the 19th century is a century of stress. Here is Albert saying, look, we're undergoing, this is how people put it, he said, we're undergoing this phenomenal social and cultural changes and we are under stress. As it happens, Albert didn't agree with that. His argument was that we needed more stress to make us healthy, that we needed less idleness, laziness, we actually needed to work harder and do more if we were going to stem the tide of neurasthenia and neurosis. But the point is here, he recognised that According to many people, this was a period of stress. This was a period of stress and strain that was making people ill because of the pressure to adapt to changing social circumstances. Now, we like to think this is the whole point in the sense of where I'm going here, that we have an age of stress now. And here is a very clear indication that the language, the concept, the framing of stress was very much a part of medical thinking about neurasthenia, yes, but also about heart disease in the late 19th century. There's a similar set of debates. There were a similar set of debates about uh, psychological diseases, mental illness, uh, in this period as well. Charles Mercier was a, a London psychiatrist who had um, worked with John Hewlings Jackson and began to write fairly extensively a number of textbooks and popular books as well on insanity, sanity and insanity, uh, in the 1890s. And his argument here was that insanity is always the product of two factors, heredity and stress, as a constitutional predisposition to psychological disorders, but there's also what happens to you. And what happens to you, he talked about in terms of stress. By stress, he meant lots of different things. He meant external circumstances, he meant cultural change, he meant physiological changes, he suggested that people, when they go through puberty, for example, pregnancy, childbirth, were more likely to be unable to cope with the stress of life. But here again is an example of the ways in which stress was used very prominently. And there are a lot of articles written in the journals after this. Um, Mercier wrote a couple of articles, I can't remember it was the last of the BMJ, called Stress and Stress Again. I don't think it might have been the Journal of Mental Science. Um, exploring this argument in more depth about the ways in which the stress of life, personal, social, cultural, familial, was making people ill mentally in this instance. And his argument was that in the, and this is something that played out in lots of places, is that if you, are, if you were constitutionally predisposed to insanity, minor stresses would make you ill. If you were more robust, then it needed a blow on the head or something else to make you insane. And this, was, of course, was an argument that played out in debates about shell shock in the First World War, about whether this was a constitutional problem or whether it was the, the circumstances of war, what kinds of people were vulnerable to insanity or psychosomatic conditions uh, in certain circumstances. But again, this is deeply embedded in accounts of insanity uh, in the late 19th century. And of course, much of this literature, much of Mercier's work, much of uh, the debates about shell shock, much of the work on Americanitis and neurasthenia by Sadler uh, and others, and some of uh, Clifford Albert's work, of course, um, built very strongly on George Beard's work on American nervousness. Um, the idea that there was something in modern civilization, the rapid change technologically and socially, you like that bit at the end, don't you, the mental activity, I know that's cracking that. 
Um, but this is about, in a sense, one can see this as quite comparable to the social and cultural revolution of the 60s, the way we people were suggesting that this is about liberation, it's about emancipation, the change of social relations that is difficult to cope with. Whatever the rights and wrongs of it, this is a major shift in social relations and expectations that is making people ill. And of course, again, he has the technological change, the steam power, the press, the telegraph, the sciences, and so forth. And one could almost translate that into Toffler and say, this is the kind of social technological innovation. If you think about that list at the beginning, the obsolescence of things, concerns about um, social and technological innovation, a very similar sense of the ways in which social change creates stress and strain and then creates disease afterwards. In this case, nervousness, but of course within the framework of neurasthenia, there were physical organic symptoms as well. This was not necessarily just um, the fatigue and the lassitude, but often people would suffer from headaches and heart palpitations and so forth. There was a, there was a, a sense in which neurasthenia was manifested in both psychological and physical terms. <coughs> I'm going to push you back only slightly further now. This is uh, 1872 uh, from a, a, a feature article in The Times suggesting that deaths from heart disease were on the rise. And of course, it should be no surprise to you now to uh, see how they explained it. The unavoidable result of the great mental strain and hurried excitement of these times, steam and electricity marked time for us, overcrowded communities, competition, struggle for existence, etc., etc., etc. The sleeping, exhausting energy needed to cope with the pace of modern life. Again, it's a formula that occurs very, very clearly in those other quotes through the 20th century and in Toffler's formulation of the age of stress, the age of anxiety in the 1970s, so 100 years after this. Not word for word, but one would imagine a fairly easy cut and paste job between the Times and Toffler without too much difficulty. Even the language is very similar, I think. So, where are we? What am I trying to say here? The, the question I suppose I started with is, is the age of stress, stress a reality or a myth? And this, this, this cartoon is from 1989, a Mac cartoon in 1989, about, and during this period, executive stress was a major preoccupation. Nobody cared anymore about the uh, stress of socioeconomic deprivation, about overcrowded communities and poverty. This became the buzzword in many ways, the focus for much stress literature in this period was executive stress, because it fitted to some extent with concerns uh, about capitalism, economy, individualism and so forth. Uh, this was part of the, of the political context in the 70s and 80s, this notion of executive stress and productivity. And of course, here we have a nice uh, disjunction here, the idea that executive stress <laughs> is a myth that was being promoted and, and, and lampooned by some cartoonists but at the same time a sense of the reality of it in terms of the, the, the chairman who is drunk and doing whatever at the end of the table. So the question is, is do we read um, Toffler's pronouncements and the media at that time, if we think back to Claudia Wallace's article in the time, do we see that pronouncement of an age of stress? Do we understand that as real or as a myth? Now, you know that if you ask a historian a question, the answer is always yes and no. Um, and, of course, the answer is yes and no. My home feeling, I suppose, it's very difficult. Um, at the end of a book, when I finished the stress book, it, it's, a, it's a fairly large book and took about ten years of my life, um, in more ways than one, I think. And uh, at the end of it, I, 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 I thought, what actually have I said here? Have I answered any questions about anything? And the answer, well, Maybe, I don't know. In the big questions, I don't know. But my, my feeling at the end of it is that stress is real. Stress is a way of talking about how we feel about the world and how we cope. It might be a way of understanding how we get ill, psychologically or physically. In that sense, I think in our, as a term, as a concept, as a, as a way of explaining experience, stress is real. Whether we can argue that it's a product of the 1950s and 1960s, I think that is a myth. This idea that historians have put forward and some scientists have put forward, I think Selye, for example, because he wanted to claim priority himself and ownership of the concept, 
would say that this is a product of his own imagination, his own work, uh, his own work in the 1950s. And the way that historians have told this as the story of a postmodern condition as a result of the breakdown of modern society, I think that is mythical. I think the argument, I think, in the book is that stress is the archetypal modern condition. It is the product of the modern process of industrialization, commercialization, and competition that have created the language, the concept, and the experience of stress. And so my argument is that you can't take the traditional narrative of stress from the scientists or the historians. I think you have to understand stress or the emergence of stress in the modern world, language, concept, and experience as part of a much longer historical narrative about the impact of modern living on our health. Thank you. Mm -hmm.